Well, welcome to another Friday night. Um, we've been working through a series on complex trauma recovery really is learning to reparent ourselves. And part of what originally comes to a person's mind as soon as they hear this term reparenting is the thought of an inner child. And, and that's what I want to just talk about tonight to really help you understand better what we mean when we talk about this inner child because there's a lot of misunderstandings initially for people around that. Really, basically, it's learning to reparent the wounded part of yourself. That's what we're talking about. Now, there's been so much written about this over the last 10 years, and there's so much stuff on the Internet, on YouTube. So I don't want to go into tons of detail on it. I just want to give you really a comprehensive teaching that will lay a foundation in understanding. So kind of a thorough introduction to this whole concept of an inner child. Now, I have to tell you that for many people, when they hear talk about inner child, because it's becoming such a common term that's bantered about, for many, they immediately go, oh, that's just hokey, that's just weird, psychological mumbo-jumbo, don't really want any part of it. Or they go to, I, I can't quite wrap my head around. I don't feel some inner child inside of me, so I'm not sure what you're talking about. And so they just can't connect to this whole concept. And, and so that's really what I want to focus on today, is just helping you maybe connect better to this concept of an inner child. Now, if you're looking for resources, um, really somebody has done a lot of really important pioneer work around the inner child from the context of trauma. It's the late John Bradshaw. He passed away just a few years ago, but he wrote the book called Homecoming and has done all kinds of different things around the inner child. And I'm going to borrow some of his material today just because it's very helpful. So I want to begin with the definition he gives that I think is a very good definition of what we're talking about when we talk about, about the inner child. So he says it's the part of you that got repressed, that you weren't allowed to express as you were growing up, the parts of you. Or he says it's the part of you that is made up of unresolved childhood experiences. So the painful things that happened to you that you weren't allowed to resolve, so they got repressed, left unresolved, that's your inner child, that part of you. So the, it's the hurt you, the rejected you, the parts of you that you had to hide. Because if you showed them you got rejected, abandoned, punished, made fun of. So it's the part of you that was never validated or accepted. And so it's the wounds that you picked up as a child that were never allowed to heal. So that's all part of what we're talking about with this inner child, this wounded part of you. Now let me just see if I can put it into a way that might help you connect a little bit better. I would say your inner child is kind of the part of you that got left behind, the part of you that got rejected and abandoned and hidden. So think of it this way. It's really the brain's way of responding to hurt that can't be resolved in a child. So let's say that you are express a lot of sadness growing up and immediately your family judges you that you're bad for being sad go to your room don't come out to your happy and so all of a sudden you realize wow if I show sadness then I get rejected I don't get loved so I don't like being sad I don't like this part of me that's sad so I'm gonna push it down lock it away never let it be seen again so I'm going to get rid of one emotion. 
And then you find out you, you have a lot of anger that comes out because life is unfair. You're getting hurt a lot. But every time you show anger, you get the same response. You get judged. You get rejected. Nobody loves you. So you say, I hate this part of me that's anger. I'm going to lock that away. And then you find out that you're quite shy. You're an introvert. But everybody makes fun of you for that. And they, they, they make it sound like you're inferior because you're shy. And so you, you go, I hate the fact that I'm so shy. And you reject that part of you, lock it away, and try to wear a mask. And so everything you lock away, you wear a mask to try to create what you think people are wanting. And then you're made fun of for being sensitive. And so you try to lock that away. So over the years of childhood, as you express different parts of yourself and they are not accepted, you're not loved if you express that, you lock that away. You wish you could cut it out of yourself. You hate those parts of you. And so you lock them away in a closet. And it's like part of you, the wounded part of you that was rejected, got left behind. And the rest of you was allowed to grow up. So, but here's what I want you to see. At first, you locked those parts of you away because other people rejected them. But did you see what began to happen? Is eventually you rejected those parts of yourself. You hated those parts of yourself. And the reason is, is they rejected those parts of you and you believed that if you didn't stop them, you would be abandoned. You would not be loved. So you saw those parts of you as bad, as getting in the way of love, uh, of being loved, as something that would cause people to abandon you, not just your family. And so you hated that you had those parts that would cause others to be abandoned. So, take it further. Not only did you reject those parts of yourself, you actually abandoned those parts of yourself. So, because you didn't want anybody else to abandon these parts over here, you rejected and abandoned those parts over there. So that you would never be abandoned. So there's parts of you that you are not just left behind. There's parts of you that you've rejected and abandoned and do not like. And so your inner child is the part of you that wasn't allowed to express itself, wasn't allowed to grow. It's all of the pain, the wounds, all of the parts of you that weren't loved, weren't accepted. And so those parts are stuck in the past. But here's two problems that I want you to understand. Those rejected parts of you, that's still part of you. You may have locked it away. You may have abandoned it yourself, but it's still part of you. But here's what I want you to see. In rejecting those parts of you, you've become less human. Now, you have not a full range of emotions. You only allow a few emotions. So you're not a full human. You're less than human. But more than that, you're less than who you really are. Because you've cut away parts of yourself. So they're still there, but they're cut away. So you're wanting to be less human, less you, in order to get accepted. And so what happens because of that is people in complex trauma go, I don't really know who I am. I've locked away parts. I basically don't have many emotions that I feel or express. I wear masks all the time. And so as soon as you start rejecting parts of yourself and wearing masks, you don't know who you are. But there's a second problem that comes out of this. You may think you have locked everything away and it doesn't affect you, but that wounded part of you still affects you today. 
It might have been wounded 40, 50 years ago, but it can still affect your behavior today. So to lock it away does not mean it's no longer there and it doesn't matter and it doesn't affect you. No, it still does. And it affects you in negative ways. Let me explain that. We talk all the time in recovery about the reality of triggers. So if somebody disrespects you or somebody treats you like you're stupid, all of a sudden you can just lose it. And in those moments, you can do a lot of damage when you lose it because you go to in a nanosecond to anger, to lashing out. What is a trigger? A trigger is your wounded child getting the wound of the childhood poked and it's going, ouch, and it's reacting. So what happens today? You get disrespected? Yes, it happened today, but what I want you to see, it's something that happened also 40 years ago. And that's what's causing you to react the way you do today. It's not about just what happened today. It's that you're still being affected by an unhealed wound from 40 years ago. Your inner child, the wounded part of you, is being hurt again, and it is responding. And so it's something that happened years ago that hasn't healed, and it still affects your behavior today. Okay, some of you might be saying, okay, I'm still not quite sure. I connect to this idea of an inner child that there's some part of me that I've abandoned. So let me give you a test, and it's a very simple test. It's just six indicators that you have abandoned parts of yourself. So number one, you deny or repress inner feelings in order to avoid conflict. So you're willing to say, what I want doesn't matter, because I have to stay safe, so I won't stand up for me or what I believe in order to avoid conflict, because in conflict, somebody's going to get hurt. So you are willing to abandon yourself to not get hurt. That's a sign of self-abandonment. Second one, avoid, you avoid setting boundaries or confronting those who cross your boundaries. So again, you're not willing to stand up for yourself. You've abandoned yourself because you want to please others or avoid conflict. Or you go into a new relationship and you see all kinds of red flags, but you ignore them. So you don't stand up for what's best for you by listening to the red flags. You've abandoned yourself. Or you use drugs or alcohol to self-medicate. You don't want to pay attention to the pain and resolve it in a healthy way You just want to numb it and make it go away. You've abandoned that part of yourself. You say yes when you really want to say no. You abandon part of yourself. You withhold your desires, wants, or needs in a relationship in order to not seem needy. So you don't tell people what you need or want because you're afraid they might reject you. So again, you don't stand up for yourself You've abandoned part of yourself. Okay, now let me give you another test. And we're going to do three tests here in total. This one is, okay, I think maybe I might have this inner child, this wounded part of me, but I'm not sure. So this is known as an inner child suspicion questionnaire. And if you answer any of the questions yes, you can expect that there's this inner child in you has been wounded. There's a part of you that has been wounded. And so because there's degrees of woundedness, you're going to be somewhere on a scale of mildly wounded to severely wounded. And the more questions you answer yes, the more severely wounded you have been. Okay, so 16 questions. Do you have or have you had in the past an ingestive addiction? In other words, overeating, overdrinking, overdrugging. That's a sign 
that you're, there's something wounded inside of you. Two, do you have trouble trusting your ability to get your needs met? Do you believe you must find someone to meet them for you? Yes or no? Three, do you find it hard to trust other people? Do you feel you must be in control at all times? Yes or no? Those are indicators that there's a wounded part of you. Four, do you fail to recognize bodily signals of physical need? For example, do you eat when you're not even hungry? Or are you often not aware how tired you are? Yes or no? Five, do you neglect your physical needs? Do you ignore good nutrition or fail to get enough exercise or rest? Do you go to a doctor or dentist only if there's an emergency? Number six, do you have deep fears of abandonment? Do you feel or have you ever felt desperate because a love relationship ended? Yes or no? Seven, have you considered suicide because a love relationship has ended, your lover has left you, or your spouse filed for a divorce? Number eight, do you often feel that you don't truly fit in or belong anywhere? Do you feel that people don't really welcome you or want your presence? Number nine, in social situations, do you try to be invisible so that no one will notice you? Number 10, do you try to be so helpful, even be indispensable in your love relationships that the other person, friend, lover, spouse, child, parent, cannot leave you? Number 11, is oral sex something you most desire or fantasize about? That's a very interesting one that I don't have time to explain the connection to that wounded person inside of you. Number 12, do you have great needs to be touched and held? This is often manifested by your needing to touch or hug others without them even asking you to. 13, do you have a continual and obsessive need to be valued and esteemed? 14, are you often biting and sarcastic to others? 15, do you isolate yourself and stay alone a lot of the time? Do you often feel it's not worth trying to have a relationship? 16, are you often gullible? Do you accept others' opinions or swallow things whole without thinking them through. How did you do on that? All of those indicate there's something wounded in you that you're responding to with unhealthy things. And so again, the more you have, the more wounded you are. Now I want to go to a very detailed questionnaire and this comes out of John Bradshaw's work, but it's a wounded child questionnaire. So again, do I have my inner child? What, what are its wounds? And what indicates that I have this inner child? So we're going to begin with identity. So I experience anxiety and fear whenever I contemplate doing anything new. Yes or no? Number two, I'm a people pleaser nice guy, a sweetheart, and have no identity of my own outside of pleasing everybody. Or number three, I'm a rebel. I feel alive when I'm in conflict. Or four, in the deepest places of my secret self, I felt there is something wrong with me. Five, I'm a hoarder. I have trouble letting go of anything. Number six, I feel inadequate as a man or as a woman. Seven, I'm confused about my sexual identity. Eight, I feel guilty when I stand up for myself and would rather give in to others. Nine, I have trouble starting things. Ten, I have trouble finishing things. Eleven, I rarely have a thought of my own. Twelve, I continually criticize myself for being inadequate. Thirteen, I consider myself a terrible sinner and I'm afraid I'm going to hell. Fourteen, I'm rigid and perfectionistic. 
15. I feel like I never measure up, never get anything right. 16. I feel like I really don't know what I want. 17. I'm driven to be a super achiever. 18. I believe I don't really matter except when I'm sexual. I'm afraid I'll be rejected and abandoned if I'm not a good lover. 19. My life is empty. I feel depressed a lot of the time. And 20. I don't really know who I am. I'm not sure what my values are or what I think about things. So those are questions around identity, and it's the identity of somebody very wounded. Next one are basic needs that reveal deep wounds. I'm out of touch with my bodily needs. I don't know when I'm tired, hungry, or horny. Number two, I don't like being touched. Number three, I often have sex when I don't really want to. Four, I have had or currently have an eating disorder. Five, I am ashamed of my bodily functions. Six, I rarely know what I feel. Seven, I feel ashamed when I get mad. Eight, I rarely get mad, but when I do, I rage. Nine, I fear other people's anger, and I will do almost anything to control it. Ten, I'm ashamed when I cry. Eleven, I'm ashamed when I'm scared. Twelve, I almost never express unpleasant emotions. Thirteen, I'm hung up on oral sex. Fourteen, I'm obsessed with sex. Fifteen, I'm obsessed with sadomasochistic sex. Sixteen, I spend an inordinate amount of time looking at pornography. Seventeen, I have exhibited myself sexually in a way that violates others. Eighteen, I am sexually attracted to children, and I worry that I might act it out. In other words, deeply wounded people usually have sexual issues. Nineteen, I have sleep disorders. Twenty, I believe that food and or sex is my greatest need. So those are how woundedness affects my response to my basic needs. The next one is how woundedness affects how I approach socialness. Number one, I basically distrust everyone, including myself. Number two, I have been or am now married to an addict. Three, I am obsessive and controlling in my relationship. Four, I am an addict. Five, I am isolated and afraid of people, especially authority figures. Six, I hate being alone and I'll do almost anything to avoid it. Seven, I find myself doing what I think others expect of me. Eight, I avoid conflict at all costs. Nine, I rarely say no to another's suggestions and feel that another's suggestion is almost an order to be obeyed. Ten, I have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility. It is easier for me to be concerned with another than with myself. Eleven, I often do not say no directly and then refuse to do what others ask in a variety of manipulative, indirect and passive ways. 12. I don't know how to resolve conflicts with others. I either overpower my opponent or completely withdraw from them. 13. I rarely ask for clarification of statements I don't understand. 14. I frequently guess at what another's statement means and respond to it based on my guess. 15. I never felt close to one or both of my parents. 16, I confuse love with pity and tend to love people I can pity. 17, I ridicule myself and others if they make a mistake. 18, I give in easily and conform to the group. 19, I'm fiercely competitive and a poor loser. 20, my most profound fear is the fear of abandonment and I'll do anything to hold on to a relationship. And then at the end of the test says this, if you answered yes to 10 or more of these questions, 
you need to do some serious work. So what I want you to understand is for most people coming out of complex trauma, you've got lots of wounds from childhood. And until you learn to parent, reparent that wounded part of you, you're going to continue to have problems in adult life. And next week we're going to look at reparenting that wounded part of me and my inner child and how to do it. But let me just go to a couple other things for today. That wounded child initially is in pain and doesn't want to be in pain. They try to resolve the problem. Often it doesn't work. But what we've come up with are seven what we call inner child archetypes. And, and what we mean by that is the brain's initial response to the wounded child adaptations it does to try to protect the child from getting hurt again. So those are the seven inner child archetypes. So number one is the caretaker. So this is the wounded child who doesn't want to get wounded again. So the brain goes to, let's set up codependent relationships where I gain my sense of value, identity, self-worth through helping others, but I neglect my own needs. And I believe the only way that I can get love is I have to care for others and earn their love. And that means I have to ignore my own needs and make the needs of others the priority. The second archetype is the overachiever. And so basically, is I don't want to get wounded today again, so I need to be respected, and that means I need to get it through doing, through achieving, through succeeding. So I'm going to become the best at everything. And then people will respect me, value me, and love me. And I won't get hurt again. And then the third one is the underachiever. And they go, the way to not get hurt again is to keep myself small, invisible, under the radar, unseen, so that nobody will criticize me then because they don't notice me. Nobody will put me down or punish me because they won't see me or notice me. So they take themselves out of life by isolating by never asserting themselves, never putting their desires or opinions or needs out there, they try to be unseen. And part of what they hope is if I never cause, create demands on anybody, problems for anybody, then maybe people will love me. Then the next one is the rescuer, the protector. And so they ferociously run around trying to help everybody in a crisis, trying to heal them, protect them, get them out of the crisis, be their savior, be the hero. And so they burn up all of their energy by finding people who need them, creating dependent relationships with them, people who are not helping themselves or not able to help themselves and they do everything for them and they go, wow, if I am their, basically their savior, I'm the one who takes care of them and meets all their needs, then they're going to adore me and they're going to love me and value me. The next one is the life of the party. So the way I never get hurt again is I will be happy all the time. I will be funny I will entertain others. I will never show pain, never show weakness, never show vulnerability. Everything is going to be fun. I'm going to make people laugh. I'm going to keep everything light. And so people will never get angry. People will never want to hurt me. They'll like me. I'll, they'll want me at their parties. They'll value me. And that's their solution. And then six, the yes person. So whatever you want, I will drop everything I'm doing and do what you want. I will be a people pleaser. 
I will never say no to you. I'll never set boundaries with you. And so again, you get drawn into whatever you want matters. I will repress all of my desires, all of my needs, and serve you, and please you, and take care of you. And we've covered many of these in the past. And then the final one is the hero worshiper. And what that basically means is, if I adore you, if I make you the center of my universe, if I just pour all kinds of praise and adoration on you and constantly give you positive feedback and tell you how wonderful you are and do stuff for you and bend over backwards to support you, will you love me back? And so those are the seven arch archetypes of what a wounded child initially might try to not get wounded again. And those can become masks and roles that they play into adult life. So let me take it to healing. So like I said, next week we're going to look at how do you connect with this wounded part of you. Because you've rejected it, you've ignored it, you've abandoned it. And for some, it's going to take a while to kind of be aware of that part of them and reconnect. So that's next week. But let me just give you some cautions. There's three issues that many people need to be aware of. So a lot of people, when they hear that there's a wounded part of them, they go, oh, okay, I got to go and love that part of me. And they want to rush in and just say, oh, I love you, I love you. But what you have to understand is that wounded part of you basically has your personality from when you were wounded. And it doesn't trust you because you abandoned it. You hated it. You rejected it. And so it's wary of you. And if you come rushing in and you just want it to have a relationship with you, it's not going, yeah, I, I've been waiting for you to come and I want to have a relationship with you right now. No, it's going, I'm not sure I can trust you. I'm not sure I've seen enough change in you to be convinced that you are going to stick with this relationship with me. And so what you have to understand is that building a relationship with that wounded inner child, the wounded part of you, could take time before it begins to even open up to the idea of a relationship with you and before it can trust you. The second thing I've seen so many people do is when they hear about this wounded part of them and they identify, yeah, I can feel it, I see it, they're in their limbic brain, they're feeling all of this empathy, they're feeling sorry for that wounded child, and they want to rush and have a relationship with that wounded child, but all of their motivation is coming from their limbic brain, which is emotion-driven. What happens is a month down the road, two months down the road, when that empathy and that compassion for that wounded child kind of disappears, and having a relationship with their wounded child gets boring, gets to be a routine. Oh, this is just too much work. It's not fun anymore. I'm not feeling all those warm emotions anymore. And they start neglecting their inner child. They start abandoning their inner child again and doing even more damage. So don't rush to start a relationship with your inner child if it's coming from your limbic brain. Only start a relationship with your inner child if in your cortex you have thought it through and you have said, this is a long-term commitment and I have to be willing to show up every day. And I have to be willing to show up on days I don't feel like it. And I have to be present every day. I just can't go through the emotions without being present. Because if you do this inner child work without that kind of commitment from the cortex, you're going to just re-traumatize and hurt that inner child. And then the final thing is, a lot of people say, okay, I want a relationship with my inner child. And they think, okay, this will be like a one month or a two month program I'm going to do with my inner child. And it's going to all be good. And then it's going to be fixed. And I'll go back to my normal life. 
No, this is a relationship that's going to go on for the rest of your life. Because you're starting to relate to a part of you that you've cut yourself off from. So trauma basically is dissociating or disconnecting from self. And you've allowed yourself to reconnect with some parts of yourself. But now in reparenting the wounded part of you, you're now connecting with that part of you, not in a temporary way, but for the rest of your life. No, you want it to heal, and you want it to grow, and you want it to all be integrated as part of who you are again so that you can express that sensitivity and that sadness and be proud of that that's the way I am and be okay with being shy. But there's still going to be this relationship you have with your interior life, with your wounded self that goes on for the rest of your life. So that is just an introduction. I hope it just gives you a little bit to think about, helps you connect a little bit with this concept, and next week we'll come back and explore it further. So that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break, come back for part two, which is the Christian part. If you're not interested in that, not a problem. Um, we're not offended at all. You're free to go. We'll see you next week. Everybody else will be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We're getting near the end of our study in the book of Ruth, where we've been looking at the life of Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. And over the last two weeks, we've had a new character that we've been looking at, Boaz. And Boaz is a relative of Naomi's husband who has died. And so he's known as a kinsman redeemer. And so two weeks ago, we looked at Ruth, under Naomi's direction, going to Boaz in the middle of the night when he was threshing grain and proposing to him and asking him to marry her and saying, because you're my kinsman redeemer, you have a responsibility to care for me and my ancestors because there's no other men in the immediate family to take care of us. And so that's where we left it. And we looked at what it means to be a kinsman redeemer. The sacrifice one must be willing to make. So today, Boaz goes into action. And he knows that there is actually a closer relative than he. And so the closer relative has to get kind of the first opportunity to marry and be the kinsman redeemer. And if he refuses, then Boaz can respond and decide whether to marry Ruth or not. And so what Boaz then does, as we're told, is he goes to the town gate and he took a seat there. Now what's important to understand is the town gate in that culture was basically the city hall. That's where the leaders of the town met and sat there. That's where they talked about legal issues, court cases, problems, policies, laws. That's where people who had a problem could go if they're looking for the authorities of the town to talk to about their problem. And so all of that happened at the town gate. And so that's why Boaz goes there. And so just then, the family redeemer, the closer relative, he had mentioned came by. So Boaz called out to him, come over here and sit down, friend. I want to talk to you. So they sat down together. Then Boaz called 10 leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. So these are the 10 of the leaders who were at the city gate, and, and they were the heads of the main families of the town. In other words, they were the most respected, powerful men in the city. And why Boaz is calling them to come as witnesses is 
In that culture, you didn't write down a legal contract. You didn't have the paper to do that. And so you would give a verbal contract with the person you were making a contract with, and then you would have the significant people of the town act as witnesses. So if ever there was a debate down the road about the contract, you would just bring in the witnesses, and they said, no, that's not how it went down. This is what was agreed to. And so everything would be kept legal. Everything would be done properly. And, and then the other reason that these ten witnesses were brought in is that if there was anything that wasn't being handled properly or legally by Boaz, they could point it out. So they were the legal advisors, the experts in the law, in the customs of that town, of that culture. So Boaz says to this family redeemer in the audience of these ten witnesses, you know Naomi, who came back from Moab. She is selling the land that belonged to our relative, Elimelech. And so the purpose of the kinsman redeemer was to buy the land so that it stayed in the family. Okay? So he says, I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away because I am next in line to redeem it after you. So the man replies, oh, okay, I'll redeem it. Now it's important to understand why he responds so quickly. So we saw last time that the kinsman redeemer, let's say the land was a million dollars, ten million dollars, he would buy it. Then he would have children with the wife, and that land would go to those children. But those children would not be considered his children. They would be considered the children of the late husband. So that when the wife died, the children would get all the money, and he would have no access. So basically, he would lose that million, ten million dollars. It would be gone. Be gone to the, that other person's family. So there's a huge sacrifice. So why does he agree so quickly? Well, he thinks he's going to be marrying Naomi. Naomi doesn't have any children, and she's too old to have children. And so what would happen in that case is once Naomi dies, the land would go back to him and to his existing children. So the money would not leave his family in that case. Well, Boaz is ready for this response, and so he says this. Of course, your purchase of the land from Naomi requires not that you marry Naomi, but that you marry Ruth, the Moabite, the widow. Ruth is substituting for Naomi. Ruth is still young, in her 20s. She can have children. And more than that, she's a Moabite. She's cursed. So if you marry her, there's a good chance you're going to lose your money. And if you marry her, you're marrying somebody that people look down on and that could affect your reputation. And so immediately the man says, then I can't. Because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem it. I cannot do it. So, Boaz says, okay. And then we have this legal transaction, so I'll explain it as we go. Now, in those days, it was the custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right of purchase to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction. So the other family redeemer drew off his sandal and he said to Boaz, you buy the land. And so what that was saying, it was a metaphor, is I am foregoing my right to walk on the soil of this land as if it was my own. I'm giving you the right to walk on the soil of this land and make it your own. What I want you to understand in all of this is 
here's this kinsman redeemer, and in his mind he has good reasons to reject taking care of Naomi and Ruth. Because, but then it, it's easy to not think too deeply about those reasons because Boaz is there and Boaz is going to step in and do it. But ultimately you see either a man who there's a selfishness there or a man who there's a prejudice against this other despised country. And he's trying to say, well, no, I'm just con concerned about my own estate, my own, aunts, my own children and their inheritance. When really there's probably some un very unhealthy stuff there. And that just brings into greater focus Boaz. This man who is saying, I'm not ashamed to identify with a Moabite widow. I'm not afraid of losing my millions of dollars and that she gets it. A man stands in greater contrast because of this other kinsman redeemer to see how beautiful, loving, caring, he has the true heart of God is the point. He cares about the outcasts. He cares about people that others are prejudiced against. He isn't wrapped up in greed and getting more money. He's care, cared about meeting people's needs. And I hope that just again challenges us and encourages us. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this example of Boaz. And again, continue to create in us a heart like yours, a heart that truly loves people and isn't hung up on the color of their skin, isn't hung up on whether or not it might cost us a lot of money, but we truly love the way you love. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Thank you so much for being with us. Hope it's been helpful to you. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next Friday.